retailers can manage today's new COVID customer? That's the topic of my conversation today with Jeff Orschel. He is America's retail leader with EY. Hello, Jeff. Hey, hey, Bob. How are you doing today? Good. So, Jeff, how has the pandemic altered consumer buying behavior? Well, let me kind of back up just one second. So we've been doing this research we call Future Consumer Index, and it's all based off research we started two years ago to figure out what the consumer looked like in 10 years. And then when COVID hit, things just started accelerating. And so we launched Future Consumer Index, which is where we've been interviewing um, tens of thousands of consumers around the globe every four to six weeks. And we've done that since April, and we just completed our last one in October. Mm -hmm. And what that's allowed us to do is it's allowed us to take a look at how is the consumer changing right now in the midst of the pandemic, but it's also allowed us to get some, um, some idea of what they're going to look like coming out of the pandemic. Now, you, you ask about what the future looks like for them doesn't mean they're actually going to do it. But when you ask it every four to six weeks, you start to see is that sentiment increasing or decrease, decreasing? And what does that look like in terms of, a, of what, mm -hmm. the, what the post-pandemic looks like? Okay, so it started, your first one was in April of this year? Yes. And every six weeks after that. So how have you seen, you've got a good, a good constant snapshot, series of snapshots throughout the year. How are you seeing that attitude changing from, the, from what was essentially the early days of the pandemic to now? Um, well, I, one of the things that's not a surprise to anybody is the rise in digital commerce. And I think the big thing there is everybody's wondering what's going to happen after COVID is over. Um, will that stick around or will it not? And, and I always kind of like to say, you know, it takes six weeks to make a habit and, and 12 weeks to break a habit. <laughs> and people have been in this long enough that they're getting used to it. And what we're finding is that 46% of the consumers are now shopping for things online that they used to shop for in store primarily. For, wait, now let me get that again. 46% of the consumers who used to shop in stores are now shifting entirely online or partially online or what exactly? Well, that's that, That's for the categories that they used to shop in store for. I see. And now they're primarily doing that online. Uh -huh. And one of the things, um, one of the things that we've asked is, what will it take to get you back into a store? And um, one of the things that's pretty significant is that thirty-seven percent said that they will come back to a store that provides a great experience. And so the question is, is how do you provide that great experience? And so it, it's kind of, it kind of further elevated this transition that we're seeing in retail mm -hmm. where experience-based retailers are starting to take off and even social-based selling is also starting to take off. Well, let me ask you this. Do, do, when customers say a great experience, do they know what they're talking about? Can they visualize what that is? Well, what I would tell you is that great experience for me changes from day to day. You know, so for example, yeah, if I'm coming home from work and I've had a rough day and I need to stop and pick up something for the family to eat, my experience is a lot different than if it's a Saturday and I'm planning that great family event because I like to cook and, and I, I'll have a different experience with that. Mm -hmm. So, so there, the expectations are rising, and the technology is there. It's just technology hasn't been fully implemented. Yet. Okay. Just, so, this series of every six weeks, I'm just wondering: uh, do are we seeing like a steady trend? Does it kind of go back and forth? Are we seeing a progressively increasing number of consumers moving to online, or do you see what is the what is the broad arc of the trend over this year since April? So it. It spiked up in April and it pretty much has stayed there since then. And the other interesting thing on this, Bob, is that you would kind of expect that um, this would be in the younger generations that you would see this. And the biggest increase we saw were in the baby boomers and the silent generation, you know, 75 years old. Mm -hmm. A colleague of mine, her mother-in-law is in London, 85 years old, and they said, mom, you can't go back to the store. And they sent her a tablet and said, you gotta now start shopping digitally. And they taught her how to do it. And now she won't put the tablet down. So yeah. the older generation has proven that, hey, when you're thinking about your digital strategy, don't rule out the older generations because they've actually picked this up um, pretty handily during COVID and they, mm -hmm. they've stuck with it. I'm hearing, especially in areas that consumers much prefer in the past to, to experience in a store, and that is specifically groceries. 
that was something that a lot of people could not imagine being able to pick out and have delivered to their house, and especially an older generation. Are you seeing that as well, that uh, the, the grocery sector is becoming more popular as an online option? Yeah, so when you're talking about online for grocery, the way I define that, the way we define it in our, in our survey is it's um, the buy online, pick up in store, as well as the buy online, have it delivered to my home. Uh -huh. And that has really picked up a lot. Um, and traditionally, it's kind of interesting to see this, right? Because grocers now have the scale to start to figure out this channel that has historically been very expensive to operate. And they're at the point now where several grocers have done dark stores and they're using that not only as a dedicated fulfillment center, but also using that as a way to learn and figure out how do they refine their processes? How do they refine their policies? And how do they do that and make money more, you know, get to the point where they can make as much money on the digital side as they can in uh, tra tra traditional brick and mortar. I'm guessing that has not been solved 100% that that is still a work in progress, right? Well, it, it is, but I would tell you that, you know, one thing about COVID, it's the basket sizes have increased and that's helped the profitability of those orders. Um, and then the other aspect there is they're starting to learn how to do this. So for example, if you know that um, bottled water, for example, is one of your most ordered items, why would you then take and have a truck pull up at the back, back dock, unload it, put it on a dolly, take it off the shelf, put it on the shelf, then have somebody pick it off the shelf for an online order and go back to the back dock again, right? Mm -hmm. So they're starting to, starting to realize that there's better ways to do this because labor and retail, as you know, is one of the biggest factors that impacts profit. Interesting, because at the beginning of this, when we were hearing about the idea of stores being used as fulfillment centers, as a, in addition to people actually showing up there, they were talking about uh, store associates picking directly from the retail shelves in order to fill online orders. It sounds like you're now saying that they might be rethinking that as, as a redundant kind of process. Well, what they're doing is they're taking a look at this and figuring out where the most labor is and figuring out processes and procedures and technology. That they can yeah. Use that. Now, obviously, there were quite a few consumers who were already sold on the concept of online before this, and uh, they were a very demanding lot. Uh, I'm wondering, are consumers cutting retailers some slack? in the pandemic or are they demanding as they always did the same are their demands the same about wanting their orders quickly on time efficiently and the like with no excuses at all yeah this one really surprised me bob um 21 percent only 21 percent said that they will cut the, the retailers from slack if they don't get the service that they're expecting during mm. COVID. and that really surprised me i thought I, I wasn't expecting it to be that low. I thought it'd be probably in the mid range, but it's actually 21% are willing to give mm -hmm. the retailers some slack. That's, uh, that's interesting. I'm also wondering, I don't know if there's any overlap in this at all, but of course the talk now is all about vaccine distribution, about the need to marshal huge forces of logistics infrastructure in order to get vaccines to their intended market and, their, and, and, and patients. Will that be taking a certain amount of infrastructure away that was being previously used for consumer deliveries, thereby challenging retailers to keep up their quality of service on that side? Well, I, I think so, because all the parcel carriers have been operating at peak capacity since April. Mm -hmm. And they were all really worried about the holiday season and how do they spread out the uh, promotion so that they don't get slammed and things like that. This will have an, it's a different, it's a, it's a different chain, if you will, but I do believe it will have an impact. Um, it will have an impact on the broader retail. I would say for grocery though, a lot of grocery is done with specialized grocery specific um, of um, delivery mechanism. Um, I think the bigger issue there is one of the things that we've seen coming out of this um, survey is that 26% of the respondents said that they plan to live in a less densely populated area after COVID. They're actually, they're going to relocate they, because they of this? They say they will. They say they will. Now, we saw this before, right? There was a Harris poll I think I saw back in January or February that kind of hinted at the same thing. And then what we've seen in April, I think the number was 23%. And the last one we got was 26% said they plan to live in less densely populated areas. Mm -hmm. And if you break that down into generations, the Gen Zs and the millennials are at 37%. So again, something that I wasn't expecting to see. So if you take a look at that, and, and you know, I, I find it hard to believe that that number will actually migrate, but if a portion of it migrates, you have a 
a movement from urban areas to suburban areas or from suburban areas to, mm -hmm. to rural areas. And you can then start thinking about, well, do I have my stores in the right places? And if I'm using my store as a distribution or a fulfillment point, um, does my last mile now become my last five or 10 miles? Mm -hmm. And then those, those services that they use to get those products to their, to their consumer's home, you know, are they equipped and have the scale to, to do that when they've got a model where people are spread out um, more so than they are today? But in a pandemic, the very meaning of the word pandemic is that it is everywhere. Is uh -huh. there such thing as a less deadly area to run to in a, in a crisis of this proportion of scale? I think what's happening, Bob, is I think people are saying, hey, you know, I can pretty much work anywhere. I yeah. just need to have a lot more work from home. And, yeah. yeah, a lot more work from home. And if I'm if I move to get a great job and I can now do that same job, but I can be closer to family and friends, and I'm I'm not living on top of people and I can pay less for my cost of living. Mm -hmm. I think that's what you're seeing. I think that's the respondents, what, what's going through their minds when they say that. Now, the question I have is, you know, everything every cycle kind of reverses itself, right? So, you know, when is that sentiment going to reverse itself? But until then, I think this is something that we need to think about from a, from a retail and from a supply chain perspective. And if my end consumer, that last node in the supply chain is now much different than what it is today. What does that, what, what do I have to start thinking about doing there? Did you get anyone saying, and I've heard this as being a sentiment along, uh, among a lot of people, is that we are so stir crazy during this lockdown. We can't wait to get out of our houses with the idea that maybe people will flock back to stores just for the social nature of it, just for the freedom of being able to go somewhere. Is that not a factor in terms of a, a future retail trend? Well, you know, the one thing that this has taught me, um, and I've always known this, but I really kind of, it came to life is that the human species is a social species. And uh, I, I myself am craving human interaction more than just a two dimensional person on the other end of the table. <laughs> Um, but I do think, I think we'll see some of that, we'll see people flock back, but the question is, is, is it going to be just a blip or is it going to be, uh, are they going to be stuck in the habits that they have? Yeah. And I kind of think, um, some of these habits I think are going to stick around. So the future consumer index continues every six weeks for the foreseeable future. You're going to keep this up. Yeah. The next one we're going to do is in January. Um, I'll be glad to come back and talk to you about the latest results we have in January. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, we'll see what happens after that. Hopefully we'll be further along that vaccination route and the world will look a little bit different by then. Definitely want to check back in with you, Jeff Orschel of EY. But for now, thank you so much for sharing the findings of your latest series of future consumer indices or indexes. Uh, thanks very much for being with us and uh, really appreciate. Take care. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Bob.